this came about because um, some time ago, uh, when Richard de Bencourt died, um, a piece of paper was found on the wall of his studio that included 10 uh, notes to himself on starting the painting. That's how he titled it. Well, a lot of people write notes to themselves. They're not necessarily interesting, but Dippin' Corn was always very interesting to me for many reasons. So, though I can't see it, what I wrote there because the computer is there, I'm here, but uh, I think I remember. He was born in 1922. Um, he, uh, started drawing and painting when he was four or five and just always did that all his life. Grew up, uh, went to Stanford. Oh no, he was born in Oregon and then moved to the Bay Area with his family when he was two. His job was flying above the California and doing aerial photography for the map made. What's interesting about it is that his early paintings actually look quite a bit like aerial photography. Here's one from the Berkeley series that was done in the 60s. Um, after, after the war, he returned uh, to Berkeley and started painting. And this is when interesting things started happening, to me interesting. Uh, this is what Dippenborn does in the early, well, in the late 50s, early 60s in Berkeley. And you imagine that time in New York, you know, New York school, abstract expressionists, everybody is macho, everybody is doing big paintings with a lot of gesture, a lot of, um, you know, that sort of power and drive. So, you know, de Kooning, Pollock. Pollock is on the cover of Time magazine with his three paintings. Uh, so Dippenkorn starts doing that exactly at the right time, except that he's doing it on, in the Bay Area where nobody's doing it. Uh, a few other friends also did, and eventually he became quite well known for that. And start and did quite well with it. Uh, started having gallery exhibitions, and then something interesting happened. Um, sometime in the early '60s, when he's finally getting a measure of success, he turns around and starts doing um, tiny little representational paintings. Maybe we could go next slide. So this. This painting is probably eight by 10. I can't see from here, it's square, but it's tiny. It's about this size. Um, some of them are bigger, but they were all representational. People would get together in somebody's studio in Berkeley, get a model, look at the tomato with a knife or something like that and paint it, which is not a big deal to us, but in Berkeley in early, 60s, that was a crazy idea. <laughs> uh, that's, nobody did that. You were supposed to do huge abstract paintings. Um, they didn't do it. They started doing that, and people came to him and said, look, Richard, this is stupid. This, you're just going to ruin your whole entire career. This is the end. This is not going to lead you anywhere. And it didn't for a while. Um, he tried to look for his fortunes in New York, that didn't take. He actually briefly, very briefly, lived in Philadelphia and drove a taxi cab <laughs> in his late series. But eventually he gave it up and went back to the Bay Area, which is home. And slowly, little by little, it started taking. Other people were interested, other artists, um, Elmer Bishop, David Parr, Joanne Brown, people that are now known as a Bay Area uh, figurative school. And um, I don't remember what my next slide is, but let's flip to it. 
Oh yeah. So here's a large scale, uh, more figurative work. I guess it's uh, edge or it's a sea wall. It's the edge of the plane falling into the Pacific Ocean. So um, a lot of those paintings are influenced by Matisse because he had um, Dimit Gorn had. Um, a grant to go to Hermitage in Russia to look at the Matisse. Uh, Matisse ended up in two large foreign collections, Barnes here and Hermitage in Russia, because there were people that bought his work when nobody else did. Uh, so that had a quite a riveting um, effect on Dibben Corn as visible from his paintings later on. Anyway, so he's doing those representational things. You can see them in the museums now, but at the time it was a bad idea, though he eventually became known for them and did quite well, had a couple museum shows, had a gallery in New York and in California, getting a teaching jobs at Stanford and um, elsewhere, oh, at San Francisco Art Institute. And what does he do? At some point, he just turns around, I think 1966, moves to LA and starts doing huge geometric abstractions. <laughs> Next slide. Um, along those lines. Uh, the so-called Ocean Park series, um, which is really what he's known for now, and he did those until his death. Uh, and I don't know where it is. I, I should know, but it's on the computer and not here. But he died um, in 93. Thank you. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, so here's a man who always did whatever the hell he wanted. And when I was a young artist, I kind of wanted to do the same thing. I thought this is art. You know, we're not doing. It's not accounting, it's not driving a bus, it's art. You're supposed to enjoy that, every moment of it. You're supposed to do what you want. And then you go to art schools and it's treated as a career, you're told about the proper career moves, and here's a man who obviously ignored his so-called career not once, but twice, and got away with it. Fascinating. Of course, I would want to uh, read his notes to himself on starting the painting. Uh, the notes turned out to be cryptic. It's, um, you know, if I was hoping to find some wisdom in there, I found some, but not a hell of a lot. Mostly it opened um, areas for questions. And it turned out that there are no answers, really, in. Um, in art and painting, there are just questions. The questions and willingness to um, to come up with an answer. And nobody knows what's the right one, what's the wrong one. Um, so Dibbenkorn comes in with stuff, those ten notes. I come up with my own ideas of what they mean. Some are clear, some are not. And um, I started using it to talk about paintings because I think it opens up really great discussion about how, what really matters in painting. Because, you know, you're all taught here how to paint. You have tremendous skills. Your teachers have even more tremendous skills. It's really wonderful. Other schools don't teach at all how to paint, but they have tremendous skills in uh, thinking about painting or talking about painting. <laughs> so, um, everybody has tremendous skills, but that does not necessarily produce good paintings. I mean, it's good to have skills. Um, it's hard to do anything without skills, but in themselves, skills don't seem to be enough. Um, so, the questions keep coming up. I mean, I've had to face those questions. I'm a painter, this is what I do every day of my life, seven days a week for the past, I don't know, 20 years. Uh, hopefully for the next 20 years, if I survive that long. Um, so, 
it's burning questions to me. So I started this, it's very loosely based, it has pictures that are not deep in corns, uh, arches that I admire or know. Um, trying to illustrate what I think those 10 points mean. And um, I don't really have a huge amount of information to deliver. It's more of a discussion than a, um, information. So please feel to, free to interrupt me anytime if you have different ideas, because this works very well as a conversation rather than a lecture. So, um, let's go to the next slide. <coughs> Here are the, the points. Uh, some of them kind of bleed off, but we, they will be repeated on, later on on um, slides. Here's another ocean park painting, so that's what they were. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Yes. Next. Yeah, let's switch to the next. So, um, it's a little difficult to read, um, but... Yeah, I apologize for the aspect ratio. We tested it before, and I don't know why it's coming out. Well, yet. maybe we could just move that, because they tend to be all on the right. Um, so if we move that thing just ever so slightly over... Oops. No, the other way. Oh, you want to go? Yeah, that way. See, then you can read. So, number one, attempt what is not certain. Certainly, certainty may or may not come later. It may then be a valuable delusion. <laughs> that's wonderful. I mean, that's just a spectacularly interesting um, and funny thought, but what the hell does it mean? Um, so I started looking, and of course you look at Antonio Lopez. Um, I mean, I admired this painting for so many years. Then finally I saw it live when Antonio Lopez had a retrospective at the Boston Museum. And pretty much everybody I know went to Boston to see it because he was going to deliver a lecture. And he did deliver a lecture in Spanish and the translator sucked, so we didn't understand <laughs> anything. But I, I, met, I met a lot of people that did what I do and it was a very exciting uh, day in Boston. Anyway, that's when I saw this painting. And I remember for years before when I was teaching, which I don't do anymore, but I taught for 15 years, um, I used to tell students, just look at this. Look at this ham here, how beautifully it's painted. You can't see it because it's a slide, it's a rough resolution, but it's incredibly realistic, incredibly well done. And then I was in Boston, I looked at it, and I saw that it's actually not painted at all. It's cut out of the magazine and glued to the canvas. <laughs> uh, because he could. Uh, because that was fine. So. Antonio Lopez thinks that, let's, can I see this again? Certainly. What it says there. So attempt what is not certain, certainly may, certainty may or may not come later. So what he does is that he moves the woman's head because he doesn't like where it is. Maybe he discovered that his viewpoint was wrong for whatever reason. Here's a man who puts a nail in the floor in front of his feet, so he's always standing in the same place. And then he stands there for the next 10 years <laughs> doing that painting. Um, so he moved the head, but he didn't finish it because he solved that like a chess problem. I know and he knows that he can paint this hand better than anybody alive, so why bother? Mm -hmm. He just glued it in there. It's unfinished painting, but I, to my eyes, one of the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen. And it kind of starts, um, to me, answering what exactly Dibbenkorn meant by that, attempting what is not certain 
and hoping that certainly certainty will become this valuable delusion. In other words, you never are certain. I don't remember. What's the next slide? Let's, uh, oh, yeah. That is a great example of attempting what is not certain. So de Kooning uh, moves to Long Island in the 60s also. He had enough with New York City. It was all dirty and loud. Uh, he's doing well. He moves to Long Island, starts doing those paintings about Long Island. If you look at the structure of that painting, whether you like abstract paintings or not, it's fascinating because it's a diary of its own conception. You can see how it was done. You see this beautiful blue and white structure that de Kooning built on the bottom of it. And he must have taken time to develop it, though it's very forceful, it's also quite delicate. And then after that was built, he went on the top with uh, orange and uh, white and ochre and did something very violent to negate the previous structure. Now, this painting is pro probably about as big as it appears on your screen. So the brush strokes were done with something three, four inches wide. Um, that's attempting what's not certain, because if you have a brush in your hand that is three, four inches wide and you load it with about half a pound of paint and you go to do this, it's very hard to predict what will happen. And this is at the end of working on a painting, when everything is already there, uh, when this beautiful blue and white structure already exists, then he goes and endangers that. And I love that. And I love that about uh, Dibbenkorn's noticing it, and I love it about de Kooning doing it, because that's what you have to do. Because painting is not a planned activity. It's a dialogue. It's a negotiation of some sort. You tell the painting, I want this, and the painting says, no, you can't have that, because I don't work like this. Um, and then at the end, something happens or does not. But that's what keeps it ultimately so interesting. It never gets old because it's always difficult. What's the next slide? Oh, yeah, so we need to see what it says. That's the second. Um, another fascinating observation from Dibbenkorn. The pretty initial position, which falls short of completeness, is not to be valued except as a stimulus for further moves. In other words, you start it. Um, let's just keep it there so people can yeah, see sure. it. Um, so this is Aang's uh, drawing, which he obviously um, changed his mind about one of the arms. <laughs> so. It happens to me all the time. It probably happens to anybody who paints. You start, you have this white or gray or whatever canvas, but it's empty. And you do things with it, and it has freshness and intensity, because nothing has gone wrong yet. It's, it's kind of exciting. It's rough, yes. It's awkward. It can be improved, but at the same time, it has that of intensity of something lovely and unpremeditated, like a bird song. Uh, but Dibbenkorn says, well, don't value that, because you have to contradict yourself. And this thing is only as good as a stimulus to go further. Because when you go further, what will happen? You all know what happens when you go further. Things get bad. Uh, and then they get worse. <laughs> and once they get bad and worse, that's, you know, the art students usually get depressed and artists kind of think, oh, okay, well, there it is again. Um, because they already know. Um, so that is uh, something that comes to mind after painting for X number of years. You realize that Really, painting is a result of that long, uncertain struggle, and um, if you got lucky in the first few steps, it doesn't mean that you got a good painting. It's a good beginning. 
it then has to get endangered and um, put in sort of the harm's way, so to speak. So what's interesting about uh, Ang, who I love so much, because he's such a stodgy French academician who is nevertheless probably one of the most insane artists that ever lived. Completely, I don't even understand his twisted logic, but he decides to leave all three arms here because presumably that arm was here first and then the other one went in. Um, but they both work. But with the three arms, it's a little bizarre. <laughs> um, but he leaves it that way. And you know, this is not 20th century. This is not 21st century. This is Ang. This is, uh, what is Ang? It's probably early 19th. You didn't leave three arms. You didn't do things like that. Uh, so he does that because he kind of liked the weirdness. He liked the intensity of this. It's sort of like that Indian deity with a lot of um, hands that operate independently. Um, I usually have two or three um, pictures for every one of those points. So let's see what the second one is. Oh, okay. So this is a little movie. Um, so we can start it and I'll just... This is a painting of mine and I just brought it in here because that kind of illustrates my own struggle with what to do with the pretty initial positions. I photographed the painting at the end of every day of working on it. And um, because I couldn't understand the logic of how it developed, and I wanted to know. So I have a model that was in my studio, and I have this exterior, which is a fire escape outside of my studio. I combined them, but I work directly from both out there and the model. At this point, I realized that the model was too impersonal. She was looking the other way. It, was more of a body than a person, and I wanted a presence. So the same model sat differently in an armchair that I had in the studio, and I started changing her and also the setting where she goes. At this point, I'm very happy with the fire escape. It looks good to me, but I'm starting to realize that the model is too large compositionally inside of the painting. I should have made her smaller. So I keep on trying to reduce her intensity so she would fit. Deep down, I already know that I'm going to have to give her up. But uh, for about a week or two, I just kept on trying to save her. You see how the chair is disappearing? She's kind of blending in more and more. No, finally had to give it up. Um, <laughs> got another one. That one looked good. The right size, the right position, but sort of non-committal, kind of, I'm just there. Uh, I figured I, I understand now where she goes and how big she is, but I need something else. So this is a model, model number four that comes in. She was standing on a mirror. We got her fur coat, and once she got there, it was obvious that this is it. So we go with it. So um, basically, from here on, it's all kind of refining, refining and um, making things look a little better, and then it ends, um, probably here or on the next slide. So, yeah, I did a few more things to the landscape outside, which I kind of imagined from a photograph of the snowy field. Anyway, so what happens here? So many things go within one painting, and um, most of it, 90% of everything that was done is not visible anymore. What a waste. And... Um, and also the struggle, it must have been, well, people ask me, it must have been depressing to get rid of one thing after another. And I, I don't know, I don't feel depressed about it. I feel that I'm a painter. I love painting more than anything in the world. I love doing it, so I don't care. 
I can, I can do another one, and another one. So I don't mind losing big portions of the painting. I don't mind the sort of searching in the dark without knowing exactly where it will be, because I know how it ought to feel at the end. I just don't know how it ought to look in order to feel that way. So some search goes into it and it's not a torture, it's a pleasure. And um, I also know artists who don't like painting and they usually don't enjoy this sort of approach. But to me that's what Dibbenkorn meant because he did the same thing with his paintings. Except he went even a step further by making all his mistakes shine through. He never covered anything completely. He never negated something that was there before with something that came later. Because he wanted uh, the record of the struggle, because struggle is more interesting. You know, it's like a sporting game, like a football. Nobody knows how it will end, who will win. Because if they did, it wouldn't be terribly interesting. Would it then? So, what's the next slide? Oh, yeah, this is fascinating. Now, you, we have to see the whole entire thing, but first I'll read it. Do search, but in order to find others and what is searched for. So that's when he starts getting cryptic. What the hell does that mean? Um, so, but then you realize, of course, this is painting. You think you know what you're searching, but if you knew ahead of time, you wouldn't have to do it. Just like Antonia Lopez didn't have to do this ham, or didn't have to finish the woman's face. So, first time I was in Madrid, I went to Prada, and there was this Infanta Margarita Velasquez. And I just remember looking and thinking, this is the most beautiful painting I've ever seen in my entire life. And it's completely bizarre, too. I don't understand this painting. So I started doing a little reading. But first, you know, while we were there, I would go to Prado every day for a week and look at it, that painting, amongst others. But this painting always, every one of those days. Mm -hmm. Then I did some reading. Turned out that it's Velasquez's last painting. He died when he was working. And it was finished by his uh, future son-in-law and a pupil, uh, somebody named Juan Bautista del Ma de Maza. Del Maza was a pretty good painter, but not quite Velasquez. Um, uh, he took what the master left after he died and finished it for him. But de Maza also did some searching. He also made some massive compositional decisions that, which he probably wasn't allowed. He added, um, he added to the canvas. He thought that Velasquez's composition was a little tight. And it's very difficult to see here, but you can sort of see, see this separation? Velasquez to here, Demaza from here to there. Uh, the same goes on the top. You can kind of see where one ends and another one begins and you also see it on the right side of the painting. So what he did, he added three panels. He wanted Infanta to have a bit more space, or perhaps maybe he wanted her to have even bigger skirt. Um, I don't know. Uh, well, one could argue that this did produce more airy composition but there was also the question of that convention of the time with the curtain. Paintings were done for the longest time with unstable pigments, so uh, they had to be hanged with the curtains in front of them and displayed only for special occasions. Uh, later on, some advances were made, oil paints were invented, so the paints became more life fast, more stable. Um, there was no need for the curtains, but curtains denoted expensive, important painting. If it has a red velvet curtain, it's a good painting. Mm -hmm. 
otherwise it's some cheap whatever thing. So uh, the kind of a cliche of the time began to paint those curtains on the painting. So the red brocade with gold embroidery moves away and there is Infanta. Um, unfortunately, De Maza was not as good of a painter as Velasquez, and in particular, and you're going to have to take my word for it because you can't see it, it's a low resolution slide, it's my fault. But look later in uh, any Velasquez um, book, or go to Madrid and look at the painting in Prada, it will be worth the trip. What happened is that uh, Velasquez's red brocade fabric looks like what it is. De Maza looks a little bit more like um, that Italian ham, fasciola. You know, with a, it's, he didn't get it right. So what he ended up is with this massive slab of smoked ham above the Infanta, which kind of looked dangerous for a little girl, especially considering that she died shortly thereafter. In fact, mortality was horrendous in Spain at the time. Uh, so this is her last living portrait. So if you think about it, um, what happened to this painting? Velasquez starts and dies. De Maza comes in and completely fractures the composition by adding three panels. Then he does painting on it, trying to match what Velasquez did, but he can't, he doesn't have the skill. So what he ends up with is something entirely different, something with a pasciuta and you know, weird surreal business. And that's what happens. And then I show up. And then I come into Prado and I look at it and I'm completely transfixed and I think this is the most beautiful painting ever. So what does it mean? Does it mean that what De Maza did is actually good? Did he actually improve the painting? Um, I don't know, but what happened here is a classic situation of doing a search, but in order to find something else. Because everybody was purposeful. Velasquez was purposeful, but he didn't get to do what he wanted. De Maza was purposeful, but he couldn't do what he wanted. And I was purposeful, but what I saw was not what I thought I was looking at until I read later. So, um, kind of acceptance of those mysterious ways that painting moves makes it so much more exciting and opens up how it actually functions to Dibbenkorn anyway, and I have to agree with him. Let's go to the next. Um, so here's the Richter's portrait of his young wife and the baby. That's from 1980s. Richter, of course, went to Dusseldorf Academy, which uh, was at the time very, very traditional, very classical um, art education. He did everything you guys do in here. He did the charcoal drawings, he did um, the Greek casts, he did the models, he did the cadavers, everything. He is an excellent, excellent representational painter. And every now and then he chooses to do that. And other times he doesn't. That's his business. But what's interesting is that what he does with uh, some of his, this is a beautiful painting underneath. And then he takes a squeegee and drags it right over that beautiful surface that he created painstakingly. Um, before the squeegee, the painting was sort of like a 20th century version of Ang. Very cool, very reserved, very precise, and very beautifully structured and textured. Um, it, and just like with de Kooning, there's no way of telling what that uh, squeegee will produce. How will it grab the paint? So he is willing to endanger what he did for his own reasons. And we can discuss those reasons, but I'm going to skip them now. Um, 
what interests me here is not so much his reasons, but the, his willingness to put this painting, this beautiful thing that he created, in a terrible danger. Uh, because you have to do it. Because if you don't do it, it will be safe. And if it's safe, it tends to die a little bit. It loses a little bit of its excitement, its oomph. So, um, it's, 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 and Richter is just such an interesting and maddening person when it comes to turning around and doing harm to his own work. Um, so do search in order to find something else, not what you're looking for. What's the next slide? Oh, yeah. Um, this is Shangram. Shangram Mojandar, he's a friend of mine. He's an American painter, lives in New York, teaches at MICA in Baltimore. Uh, doesn't paint like this anymore, but about 10 years ago he did. Um, his superior skills, like incredible skills, but also that sort of intense involvement with the color, very, very Indian color. Um, you know, those kind of intense, deep, slightly dirty, earthy colors. So he started doing what is very difficult to do. Um, I don't know why it is, ceilings with things protruding from them, nobody does it right. You know, just like that, just like the river or the water and the reflections. Nobody does that right either. Or mirrors. You know, like that beautiful um, Thomas Eakins uh, series of drawings and painting of two people in a rowboat. I think it's called Skull, the one that you, you, you see on Schoolkill. He did so many drawings to make sure that the reflection was just right and the people were sitting in their boat on the water just right, and he did a big painting. And after all that work, it looks like it's floating about a foot above the surface. It just doesn't work. Mirrors don't work even for Velasquez. You know, Las Meninas has a mirror, it doesn't look like a mirror. Uh, ceilings are difficult, so Shankram goes and does the ceiling with the lighting fixture, and it works beautifully. But he's not interested in selling. He's looking for something else. He's looking for uh, an excuse to get into the, that yellow ochre with that particular blue. And later on, you know, having seen his development as an artist, what he does now is more about those colors than about precisely and beautifully observed um, bits of reality. I don't know if I necessarily like what he does now better, but I respect it. It's fascinating to see somebody's search. And it's a search, the real search. I mean, the definition of search is you don't have it, so you're looking for it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's not a search. So what's next? Let me give you a quote first. Oh. Use and respond to the initial fresh qualities, but consider them absolutely expendable. It's almost like Gibbon Corn is, uh, yeah, let's leave this open so you can see it. He's kind of repeating himself, or he's trying to say the same thing in a several different ways to clarify it for himself, because it's basically what he said earlier you know, about the pretty initial position and how it's expandable and how it can lead to further delusions. Um, so here he says it again, use and respond to the initial fresh qualities, but consider them expandable. In other words, something brings you into the painting. It's very interesting. Uh, you look at things. You know, you're all trained to observe here. You look at models, uh, whatever, the still lives. Most of the people don't observe. They don't look at anything. They don't notice anything. They, they look to see where they exit, or you know, where's the bathroom, or where's the donuts. Um, 
they don't really look at, oh, look at how color of that tree appears in front of the sky. Or why do the shadows in Philadelphia are different colors than the shadows, let's say, in Madrid? Uh, they don't look at that, they don't know. But you do, because you look. And because you look, you notice them, and that starts you in doing a painting. But why not just photograph it? It would be quicker. Take a picture, have a beautiful sunset with a cow and a barn. <coughs> nice. Um, and yet we do painting. So the painting is an um, opportunity to screw up, to go wrong. This is where you come in. You are an imperfect machine for making paintings. We all are imperfect. Um, Camera is predictable, it will do what it does, especially if you know how to use it. But we're not predictable. I've been painting every day of my life, or most of my life, and I still have no clue uh, what to expect. So um, that really is an integral part of the painting. You can't get it out of there. Because if you do, nothing is left. It's just a pretty picture. So, maybe that's what Ibn Korn means. Maybe that's what he says, that you, know, you need the initial fresh qualities of the reality to start it, but ultimately painting is not about that. It's just to get you going, to just push you into the direction of, OK, I'm going to look now. Um, and then see what happens. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Mm. That's my discovery. Um, Luke Zhao Dong. I, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Maybe it's Zhao Dong. He's a contemporary Chinese painter, um, and I think he is absolutely spectacular. Large format, usually, done entirely on location, outside, inside. This particular one is indoors. He did a series of paintings about the prostitutes in Hong Kong, I think. Uh, but he also did some really epic out, outdoor uh, scenes. And you see how the reality is very beautifully observed. And if you see the painting in real life with the church, Fortunately, I saw a show in Seattle. Uh, they're beautifully painted. And yet he allows them to stay awkward. You know, this is a man who can do anything he wants with uh, reality. And yet he chooses to keep some of that awkwardness in because that's what got him started in the first place. Uh, you know, the kind of thing where somebody might point to that and say, well, this is not very skillful painting. Why did he do it like that? You know, the leg looks okay, but, um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, to me, that kind of illustrates that Dibin Korn thing is that the interest in a subject is only to start you. But that when Luc Zaldon enters into the painting and starts working, the painting becomes about him. And in order to keep him in the painting, he has to allow his mistakes to also stay in the painting. Because he's a human being, he's not a camera, he's real. And um, awkwardness and roughness is not a bad thing, as it turns out. So what's next? Uh, Oh, uh, now that is really interesting. So, Franz Klein. Whether you like Franz Klein or not, whether you consider him important or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is that this painting is bigger than your screen. And it contains what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine brush strokes. So, uh, 
Those brush strokes had to be done with something the size of a broom. I know that the uh, client bought cheap black and white paint, uh, so that was not a consideration. There was gallons of it around, but still, how can you be that decisive? As a painter, I want to know. Uh, maybe I'm not going to do Franz Klein paintings, but I want to know how you can dip a broom into the bucket of black paint and confidently go across the white canvas. Uh, because you do want to succeed. You know, you want it to be a painting. Um, so, did a little reading. Turns out, this is... Uh, next slide, please. This is how. Sketches. Initial uh, fresh qualities. <clears throat> Sketches on uh, pages of Brooklyn telephone book. Brooklyn telephone, or any telephone book, if they still exist, is wonderful, wonderful... Um, medium for doing sketches. It has two qualities which are great for sketches. One is free, and the second there's already something on the pages. So nothing to worry about. And it's completely expendable, so he does those quick sketches with a brush and some ink. He collages them, then he cuts out maybe three by four inches from the middle where the collision of the lines happen just right to create a composition. And this is the same composition as anything. As Aang, as Velasquez, it's still a composition. And then he has rehearsed it. Then he can dip mm -hmm. the broom into the paint and try to do it, and he's not afraid of awkwardness. Um, it was just fascinating to me. It was an eye-opener, and obviously it was fascinating to uh, Dibbenkorn, because he sure as hell tried that also, and did better than Klein ever did, I think. Uh, next slide. Ah, now that one is open for... I still don't know if I know. Don't discover a subject of any kind. Well, I think I know what he means, and that's what we were talking about just now. You know, what is my subject? Is my subject red New England barns, or is my subject news on a sofa, or, you know, what, what is it that I do in life? If, whatever it is, it's ridiculous, because if I spend my whole entire life doing news on a sofa, then it sounds stupid. Or if I spend my whole entire life doing a tree or something like that, it's, it doesn't need me. There's something else. You know, you can't say that Turner did seascapes. You can't say that you and Uglow painted only female nudes. He didn't paint female nudes, he painted paintings. And I think that's what Dibbenkorn means. And in a way, Anne Gale, who is my friend and one of my favorite painters in the world, uh, she lives in Seattle. She does those paintings uh, intensely from observation, usually three or four of her close friends. Um, they work on it forever, for years, months. Um, they're breathtakingly beautiful, but also they very um, much about what Anne does as she is searching for the form. So this guy's name is Paul. Paul is not the subject, because Paul in dozens of paintings. We're not doing research into what Paul's face looked like. It's not terribly interesting. Um, What's interesting is how Anne keeps looking for that face and sometimes finds it, sometimes doesn't. And every time she has trouble, she starts using smaller and smaller brush and does more and more dense and agglomerated brush strokes. And when she is sailing through, things are much bigger. Uh, this is a small painting, maybe, I don't know, two by two feet, so those brush strokes are tiny, those are probably about half an inch brush. 
Uh, but the subject was definitely troubling me in that whole number five rule. So there's a couple more there. Let's skip to the next one. Same with you and Uglo, really. Uh, Welsh painter lived in London, died uh, maybe 10 years ago. I, I think there's one painting of a man by you and Uglo. The rest of them are women and sometimes he did still lives. So what is it? Is that his subject? Obviously not. Clearly his subject is color, shape, and finding that precise um, reality somewhere with imperfect um, tool of his own eye. Uh, oh, I remember what's the next one. Let's do the next one too. Next one is interesting. Justin Mortimer, contemporary British painter, the man who did discover a subject. He didn't follow the Bencorn rule, and I find that he paid for that in a way. Um, for many years, Mortimer was doing those weird post-apocalyptic figures in some sort of burned out um, situations. They're very effective, very scary the first time you see them, and they paint it really, really beautifully. Um, skills are amazing. But after you see a dozen or so, you just start getting a little annoyed. Oh, there's more naked people in um, what looks like post-apocalyptic landscape. So he let that overrun his whole work, that subject. Um, because it was so forcefully present and eventually had some sort of crisis and now does something entirely different. Uh, what else is there? Oh, now that is interesting. That's about um, six. Somehow, don't be bored, but if you must, use it in action. Use its destructive potential. That is probably one of my favorites. So, uh, Larry Rivers was, um, started out as a jazz saxophonist in New York in 1940s, got into painting, did this kind of paintings, realistic, also in a time when it was not popular. Uh, this is Birdie, his mother-in-law. Larry wanted to paint Birdie nude. Uh, Burgi did not want to be painted new. Um, it took a while to talk her into it. Eventually he did. And he was so excited that he painted her twice <laughs> in that painting. Uh, but at the same time, he was also excited about that, um, that bad spread with a pretty pattern. And uh, the headboard of the bed with a you know, what is it called? Wicker? Caning. Caning, right. They were both kind of slightly technically difficult um, things to paint because it's a very, it has to be precise. You know, Dibbencourt tried doing the um, patterns on uh, fabrics that Matisse painted, and they're very precise patterns, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So Larry Rivers tried that. And it worked quite nicely for him. So the moment it um, the moment he was bored, the moment he didn't want to do it anymore, he left it. He didn't really use the destructive potential of it. He just being a musician, he was honest. He started, it works, he stopped went to another thing. Same happened with the caning. About half of the caning is absent. Because why bother? But, so he stopped short. And the next slide, uh, I think, yeah, it's, I don't even like Richard Serra. This is Richard Serra. It's American contemporary um, artist. Usually is known for those massive core tent steel uh, installations that look like fences. I mean, I like them, but I've seen them for so many years and they're always the same that it kind of gets old. 
But this is interesting. This is Richard Serra, who is all about this macho energy. He's just this gruff and tough macho man, and everything he does is heavy and rusty and, you know, has sharp edges. So he did those drawings. He did those drawings by standing with a, you know, one of those fat oil crayons next to a piece of paper and just doing this repeatedly, hundreds of times. So that's where those lines come from. Uh, it's boring. It's a boring thing to do. He knew that. A lot of stuff that Richard Serra does is boring to do. But he used its destructive potential because if it keeps going, it becomes, there's certain kind of nasty and mean power about it that he was after. Again, whether I like it or not, it doesn't matter. I have to admit that he was successful at doing this. Um, what's our next? Oh, this is interesting. So, before I go much further, are you all staying awake? Because mm -hmm. we've been yeah. going for an hour and I still have quite a bit there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, boredom with a subject, with a painting. This is a painting by David Ollerkin, my friend, wonderful painter. At some point, but what David does is that he lives out of his car and he drives around little towns and paints uh, streetscapes on site. Uh, he went to Allentown, God knows why, now, <laughs> parked on the main street, started painting, two policemen came up to him and said, sir, you can't paint here. <laughs> And he asked them why, and they said, you need a license in Allentown to paint on the street. <laughs> I said, well, I never heard of that. Uh, because, you know, David, he drives this old Crown Victoria, which is all covered in paint, because he lets children paint on it. He's also covered in paint, and he's usually with a giant stogie in his mouth. He doesn't look respectable. The car doesn't look respectable. The policeman obviously thought that this is not what should be on the main street of Allentown. But he refused to leave because he wanted to finish the painting, so they locked him up. They locked him up in the Allentown jail. Um, I mean, not nicely, didn't break any bones or anything. Uh, but uh, they were also kind of unfamiliar with contemporary world because maybe it was Allentown, so they forgot to confiscate his cell phone. Uh, <laughs> so there he is sitting in the jail in Allentown with his cell phone, and he's a serial Instagrammer, so everything went into the Instagram about this is a painting in Allentown, now I'm, now I'm in jail because they say I have to have license to pay. So people started calling from all over the world to Allentown City Hall and saying, what the hell are you doing? What, what license? Who are those policemen? <laughs> so there was a massive scandal. It all ended very nicely with the mayor of Allentown personally apologizing and buying that painting to him. <laughs> but while he was doing it, you know, we were texting back and forth and other people and asking, what the hell are you doing painting in Allentown anyway? Uh, you could get more inspiration on the Walmart parking lot. So that's what he did next day. He went to the Walmart parking lot and did this painting, which I think is definitely the best painting in the world of a Walmart parking lot. <laughs> but I actually think it's one of the most beautiful paintings I've seen. It's, it's all there. And you know, he doesn't take very long with those paintings. So, that's... Um, so, <clears throat> David comes from the punk rock background, so the kind of destructive potential of boredom and uh, various other negative emotions are near and dear to his heart. He uses it in the painting. He never paints pretty. You know, if you send him to Walmart parking lot, he will do great painting. If you put him in the field with a tree, it mm, might not work out. Um, what's the next slide? 
That's another friend of mine, Mu Pan. Um, Mu is a Chinese painter, lives in New York. Uh, he's from, I think he's from Hong Kong. So he's been trained there. He has tremendously, uh, tremendous skill in the traditional Chinese painting, which is watercolor on vellum, very, very time consuming, very precise, very slow. Um, delicate stuff, but you know, Mu is sort of more of a fan of martial arts and Bruce Lee is not interested in delicate stuff, but that's his ideal, that's how he works. So he's bored sitting there with his tiny little brush and painting every single hair on a bulldog. So he amuses himself as he goes and um, as a result, that is a classic Mu Pan painting, and um, they're just absolutely wonderful and intense because they, all of them are about that collision course of where his skills and his interest takes him and how they don't just really live together very nicely. Um, next. Number seven. Mistakes can't be erased, but they move you from your present position. And your present position is the bad place to be. Because the only thing that remains in the present position is the dead thing. The life things don't remain there, they move. So, um, Dibbenkorn certainly did not erase his mistakes. And I admired it so much from him, and I wanted so badly to find the, my way into it. And I'm still working on it. It's probably one of the most technically difficult things what one could try, attempt to do in a painting, to keep the bad stuff in and still have a good painting. Um, you can't think of anybody more precise and more controlled than Pete Mondrian. And yet there is a drawing of Pete Mondrian with mistakes and corrections, all left in. It's fascinating. Uh, there's probably a couple more about the mistakes, so let's see. Oh yeah, that is uh, another Antonia Lopez with a um, pumpkins, he takes long time, very, very long time. The pumpkins started rotting <laughs> and collapsing on themselves. Um, he was racing with that process. Um, it's very hard to see, but again, if you look at one of his books, you will see that there's a lot of little kind of service marks, like little check marks where he put in a little cross, a little check mark where uh, key points of reality converge so he can have everything exactly like it is. And he is very good at doing that and he likes doing that. So everything is precisely how the reality is. The only problem is that reality is faster than Antonio. The, Pumpkins started collapsing on themselves from the rot, and he was racing it. And you can see on the drawing the check, check marks moving down ever so slightly <laughs> um, to, you know, to try to catch up. As it happens with most of his drawings, um, eventually he declares it a giant failure and stops it. And of course, it's probably one of the most beautiful drawing one ever seen, but not to him. Um, <clears throat> what else is there? Right, so we're talking about mistakes. Again, Frank Auerbach, you can love him, you can hate him. I love him. Um, but I don't love him because he does beautiful drawings or beautiful paintings, they're not beautiful. They sort of have, pardon my French, fuck you, uh, look to them. They are, they're intense. They mean intense and 
very purposeful. He wants to find it. He usually starts those charcoal drawings on the heaviest uh, um, watercolor paper you can find, almost cardboard. And so much work goes into it with erasing, adding more charcoal, that eventually there are holes in it which are patched with more paper. It's fascinating to see them in real life. Um, but what really happens is that every mistake that Frank Auerbach makes is really what his paintings are made of. There's something about London that it has this huge population of those crusty old men that like to do nasty things to themselves and their paintings. <laughs> and the results are sometimes absolutely beautiful, but not always. Um, I think the next one is probably Bruce Samuelson. Is it? Yes, it is. So Bruce was my teacher. He still teaches at the academy. And uh, in a way, that's Bruce's take on uh, making mistakes. He does all of that from observation. But he does not build from, you know, from general to particular, so he strays sideways and he accommodates all those detours into the painting or pastel in this case, which really what makes them um, his. He admitted, yes, I didn't get it right. But you know, if you admit something like that for 20 or 30 years, it will become known as the guy who does that thing. And that's uh, and they're really beautiful that way. What is his last name? Samuelson, Bruce Samuelson. What else is? Um, oh yeah, this one I don't understand at all, uh, but I'm trying. <laughs> Keep thinking about Poliana. Um, now Poliana is complicated as it is. I didn't know what it was. It's a bit of American trivia. I had to look it up. It, it was a children's book and a movie about this abnormally optimistic little girl. <laughs> uh, she just was positive as hell. And her name became known as a sort of like a symbol of that unreasonable positiveness. So what is, what is he talking about? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm thinking Maybe what he's saying is that there needs to be an outsized dose of idealism in painting. You know, you really have to hope for the best because most likely it's going to be bad. Because, you know, if you think about it, most of the paintings are bad. I would say 90% of them. They're awful. Um, we made that experiment, my wife and I, once. We went through all the galleries in Chelsea. It was a few years ago, there was more of them there than there is now. Literally hundreds. Just to see, what if we saw it all? How much, how many good things would there be? Um, when we came out, she cried, because it was so bad. It was so hopeless. There really wasn't much. Then I had another experience in Perugia. I was teaching the summer class nearby, and Perugia has this wonderful Renaissance museum. Um, what's wonderful about it is that it's not selective. You know, when you have a beautiful Italian Renaissance painting at the Met, it means that it took a lot of effort to extricate it from those Italians steal it basically and bring it to New York and hang it there. Lots of money, lots of effort, lots of uh, insurance, lots of God knows what else. In Italy it's just all there. Um, so everything went into that museum and you know we think Renaissance is that moment, that special moment in the history of humanity when everything was so beautiful, when everything fell together, and people produced those timeless masterpieces. And you feel so special about that time until you go to Perugia, to the Renaissance Museum, 
and you see all the bad ones. <laughs> and there's lots of them. Just awful. And then you realize, well, so that doesn't change. Most of the art is always terrible. Most of what each one of us will make is probably going to be a failure. Um, and it's fine. So maybe that is what Dibin Korn me means. Maybe it's that you need this kind of unusual optimism to, to even get into this business, because why are we in it if, we're, if our attrition rate is so high? And um, Albert York comes to mind. Uh, one of my favorite painters was a gardener in Long Island all his life. Did those little paintings on plywood, sent them to a gallery in New York who showed them. He never showed up for any of the art openings or interviews. Eventually was famous, still continued working as a gardener on somebody's estate. And did a few of those a year. And um, there's something, you know, the word Poliana comes to mind is that. Like, what is this thing? What is this painting about? I don't care. I love it. It's kind of unusually bright outlook on life and on what, what it takes to make a painting. Uh, we have to hope for the best, because most likely it will fail. Um, let's switch the slide. That's another um, unusually optimistic artist, Gilbert Lewis. He was a Philadelphia artist. He, um, many of you probably met him. He used to work at first at Pearl and then at Blick in the paint department. Gilbert was that guy with a bold head. Um, now he has Alzheimer's, so he doesn't remember anything. Uh, but I have that painting of his. And I think there's something really, really life-affirming about this painting. I just look and I think, this is an ugly-looking guy, and it's such a beautiful painting. And I don't know who this guy is, and I don't know why I need to have a painting of some naked guy with a beard in my house, but I... We know we both love that painting so much. And maybe it's that Poliana quality. Um, next. Well, Cicely Brown, you know, I don't think that illustrates the Poliana business anymore. If anything, the more I look at it, the darker it looks. It's, it's the things that well, doesn't matter, let's just go to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is not Poliana either. This is a beautiful Lucian Freud, um, still alive. But what's interesting about it is um, the composition of it. It's so British because it starts with the instruction and ends with the insult with a little presence in the middle. Uh, you know, if you think about it, every painting uh, has a way of being looked at that is built into it by an artist. So Freud starts you in the upper right corner with these two pipes. You enter in, and you go up to here where you have to turn in from the painting, and then down. And then with the other pipe, you have to go a little further and do the same thing. And for being a good boy and following the instruction, he gives you a little present of his own painting there, right above somebody's stomach and somebody's legs. After that, the water, you come out as a water dripping from the faucet. But I I think this is the most beautifully painted water dripping from the faucet I've ever seen because that's exactly how those cheap plumbing fixtures tend to drip. And to me, that maybe that's why, why I sort of Poliana when, um, when I originally put it in. 
So anyway, you drip all the way down into the dirty sink, beautifully painted dirty sink, and then what happens to you? You go to where you belong. You go down the drain. <laughs> and that's where it all ends. Um, beautiful Freud painting. Next slide. Ah, that is nine. Tolerate chaos. Chaos? How do you pronounce it? Chaos. Chaos, yeah. So this is Jennifer Paczynski. She is another friend of mine, another painter I admire. Uh, she lives in Sacramento, California, and does those paintings. And uh, Jennifer says that her goal in life is to be an unpolished painter. In other words, she does tolerate chaos. I mean, what happens here is so beautiful because we still know what that is, but it's starting to fall apart faster and faster. And I really love her paintings for that because they exist right on the edge of intense commitment to reality and intense commitment to paint. And those two things sometimes run you know, into conflict. Next. And of course there is a king of chaos himself. Um, the man is amazing. Did some of his best paintings in his late 80s. Uh, love him or hate him, um, I think He's fantastic because he built his whole entire life on his own ability to not only tolerate chaos, but to feel at home with it, to exist in there, and to really have nothing else. He's not interested in reality. He's interested in the fact that reality is messy. Um, that's interesting. You know, a lot of his paintings have uh, titles from Greek mythology, but he doesn't seem to be interested in the heroic deeds. He's interested in a part of Greek mythology that interests uh, a lot of people, the fact that those gods seem to be quite human. They have all the bad human qualities. Some good ones too, but they are not perfect. They're not infallible. And Said Fombly is fine with that. Um, and the paintings are about that. There's a wonderful room, if you haven't seen, in Philadelphia Museum, and they just added a few of his sculptures recently, which I think magnificent. Next slide. Ah, another person tolerating chaos. Uh, another friend of mine, she's a young French painter, Edwige Pauvry. She lives in Brussels. And this is a painting she did outside of Madrid. I think this is the most beautiful uh, landscape I've ever seen in life. It's just like I could look at this thing for hours. And um, not only that where it densely becomes landscape, which I don't know again how much what you can see in a low resolution, but also where things start falling apart into the mere paint. Um, I really think she's probably my favorite painter in the world. I just think this is amazing and I don't understand how she does it. Um, uh, well, let's continue because, um, yeah, this is gonna go. Okay, uh, <laughs> be careful only in a perverse way. So being careful, uh, we already figured that that's probably a bad thing, at least you did in court. But you can still do it, you just have to be perverse about it. And I put that picture a long time ago into the slide. Mikhail Bormann's contemporary German painter started it as a commercial photographer actually started painting in his mid-thirties and turned out to have amazing facility and uh, capable of doing really good technical painting. Uh, but being a German, uh, he likes a little darkness in those paintings. 
and that's kind of reliably there. So everything is good here, everything is lovely, except that you realize that the girl doesn't have legs. She's just kind of floating above the tabletop a bit. So that gets a little tiring. I kind of like him less now than I did maybe 10 years ago, but I still find it fascinating that somebody could start in their series and get that good. Next slide. Um, well, just because we are really running late, and let's skip racial literature. I can explain to you why, how that relates to being careful in a perverse way, but I think we have more interesting things. Yes, this is the last one, and this is interesting. And then we'll be done, and if you have questions, we can talk about them. So, Ang does this portrait. At first look, it's a pretty straightforward portrait, but he does that careful, precise realism in his own perverse way. I mean, I think he invented perversity. So look at what happens. The society lady posing for a very composed portrait. Everything is nice. She is next to the table, behind her window, behind the window is a landscape. Um, you keep looking, then you realize something really weird. Um, there is a volcano, and volcano is erupting. <laughs> it's a pretty dramatic event in the life of volcano. This is in Italy, so this is, I think, uh, what is that volcano near Pompeii? Vesuvius. Vesuvius, right. So Vesuvius erupting is never a good thing. <laughs> and uh, it's also quite loud thing. But she is paying no attention, so she doesn't hear that loud eruption. And then you think, maybe it's far. And then you, then you kind of start feeling the distance between her and the volcano, because the plum of feathers on her head is exactly the same shape as a plum of smoke coming out of volcano. And that little juxtaposition kind of drives home that immense distance around the Bay of Naples, between her and the volcano. And you start feeling that there's so much space there. And you start realizing it's not about the lady with her hat. It's about the space between, you know, space that is sitting on the top of the Bay of Naples. It's beautiful, clear space, but it's completely airless because there's no sound, even with volcanoes. So it's like you are in this vacuum in outer space and just when you start feeling really uh, slightly weird about this whole thing and hard to breathe you notice a little silver bell on the table next to her hand and the sound of a little silver bell is the only sound that is in the painting everything else is silence in a vacuum that is typical ang I mean, can you get weirder than that? <laughs> I don't think you can. That, that's just absolutely wonderful. He does one thing, but then he does the other thing. So, it's fascinating how, this is it, this is the last slide, how these 10 simple observations about painting makes you think about so much of what matters, what doesn't. How does one go about trying to do a good painting? Um, every time I look at this slight lecture, I always change something because I disagree with myself. Like last time I did this talk somewhere, maybe a couple years ago. I look at it and like I didn't want to talk about racial witch red. Um, I didn't want to talk about Cicero Brown. Not that I like him any less, it's just it migrates your understanding of a painting. Everything is fluid, it's fascinating. If it weren't, it would become boring. So um, I thought that was kind of worth the subject to, uh, to do a talk about here. And if you have any questions or observations or arguments, um, now is the time. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Good question. So given the fluidity of what you've talked about, just really heavy stuff, how do you look at your previous work through the years? Um, there is definitely a certain point before which everything is embarrassing <laughs> and very painful. My parents own several of those things and I keep on trying to steal them, but oddly enough it has nothing to do with skill, it has to do with honesty. At, you know, like all the art students, in the beginning you try to be somebody else. If you're smart, you mix that. You make a salad of somebody else's. So nobody says, oh, well, that looks like such and such. So I was as guilty of that as anybody else, and now it's painful for me to look. It's like, why did I want to be, for example, Richter at some point when I could be myself? So at some point I stopped trying to be somebody and I'm kind of okay with those paintings from that point on, even if technically they wouldn't have satisfied me now. So that's... What Did you find there was a, a rule that was the hardest to learn? A rule? Yeah. One of, of his. Um, well, giving things up as you go... That's hard. It's not hard because it's unpleasant or scary. It's hard because in most of the human occupations, um, not getting what you set out for is failure. Let's say you're a dentist and you're drilling teeth and you drill somebody's tooth and then there's no improvement. It's a terrible failure as a dentist. Yeah goes. Uh, but in painting it's perfectly fine. <laughs> because maybe you'll find something else there. And that is, that took a while to internalize and I still forget. I still get upset when at the end of the day I look at my painting and I lost everything that I had yesterday. I think this is awful. How can I live like that? This is uh, depressing. But then later you realize that this is what makes it fun. This is what makes it endlessly fascinating and hopefully uh, can last a lifetime because uh, it never stops being challenging. Um, on that sort of video you played of the progressions of your stages of a painting and the way it kept changing and moving, I can think of a lot of painters who would do that on different canvases. Like Manet comes to mind with his execution, uh -huh. where he paints it, and then he's like, no, that's not right. And he gets another canvas and tries again, and then tries again the third time. Yeah. Why not make a different painting? Why keep working on the same canvas or panel or whatever? That's a great question. It never occurred to me to try to spread it. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose because the layers are not solid there are holes in them. So in any given painting, um, there are holes through which you can see the original first layer. So the painting develops like a sandwich in a multi-layered fashion, and my particular painting is, has to be that way. Because I am, Well, I'm a fast painter because I, I'm not a kind of person who will build the wall brick by brick. It's just I don't have enough concentration for that. But I do like slow paintings. I mean, I like Antonio Lopez. I like Annie. So I can only do those kind of paintings by doing series of fast paintings on the top of each other and allowing some of the stuff underneath to show. That's just the way I found uh, for myself to do that kind of thing. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Okay. Ah, well, and everything else is clear. <laughs> so, um, if no questions, then thank you. Thank you.